Welcome to a four part series. This is the first part of how the self develops. This is Jurgen Rasmussen, by the way. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. So why would you want to know how the self develops? Well, the self is not a thing. It's actually a process of selfing. And this selfing process gets constructed, deconstructed and reconstructed over time. Also, as we mature and gain more perspective, our models of the world become more richer, our very selfing process, meaning what looks like self and what looks like other, tends to change in rather predictable ways. In this video, I'm going to be mostly using Robert Keegan's model of adult psychological development. My take here is also influenced by Claire Graves' Spiral Dynamics and Jane Lovinger and Susanne Cook Reuter's Ego Development Model. Now, here's the really interesting thing. If you know something about what looks like self and what looks like other, what someone is subject to and what someone is object to, you, you get a very rich map of how that person is likely to conceptualize conflict, how they're likely to make sense out of relationships, the relationship to authority, uh, dichotomies, their, their ability to make distinctions, what looks like reality and what just looks like an idea, what they're able to take responsibility for or even conceive that they could take responsibility for. It's a very useful and interesting map. Now, before we get into it, though, let me offer the following. What I'm offering here is not really how the self develops. I'm offering a model of how the self develops. And of course, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. So I would recommend that you hold it lightly. I'm not claiming that it's true with a capital T. I'm claiming that there's truth to it. It, it points to something which has both value and usefulness. Something else I would like to emphasize is this is my take on Robert Keegan's model based upon the specific context that I operate in, seeing clients for a living. So do both me and Bob Keegan a favor and don't hold him responsible for my ramblings here. You know, hold, hold me responsible for, for uh, my particular views on the model. Something else too, as, as with all maps, you know, not only are, 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 is no map ever the territory, but, but they leave a lot of things out. So no map gets to point to everything that is relevant about being a human being. This is not about personality tendencies as it is co covered in, for example, the five factor model. It, it's not about that. Um, also, whether you are a biological male or a biological female will influence how these structures of consciousness are expressed, uh, the particular culture that you're in. Your, your level of intelligence, like, like your, your, your general intelligence will influence it and also your particular personality tendencies. So the way these systems or structures get expressed might look quite different in two different people. But what I'm claiming here is that there is a structure to how the self gets constructed, deconstructed and reconstructed. And remember this, you know, so many of our conflicts in life have to do with maintaining and protecting and enhancing our own identity. You know, we're quite tribal beings and thoughts and feelings only really look like a problem when there is a self or sense of self created out of it. So having a useful roadmap around selfing is quite significant and useful. So in this first video, I'm going to be talking about 
Keegan's second order of consciousness, or what some people refer to as the self-sovereign mind. I'm going to be throwing in some ideas from Claire Graves' Spiral Dynamics and, and Jane Lovinger and Susanne Cook Reuter's Ego Development Model too, because there's some overlap here, especially at this particular form of mind or stage of development. So also, I'm talking about adults here. Uh, oh, by the way, if you're talking about psychotherapy and change work, you know, what we call depression and anxiety is going to be experienced quite differently through different forms of mind. So someone who operates from this early stage of development is going to be depressing or anxietizing quite different than someone who uses a different structure or a different form of mind. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about spiritual awakening and how that might be made sense out of given your particular form of mind. So without further ado, let's get into Keegan's self-sovereign mind. So an adult who operates here is subject to his or her um, more long-term perceived needs and agendas. So when I say subject to, what that means is that their, their, their own, um, you know, their, their, their own agendas and their own enduring interests are what they understand the world through. They see the world through that. They can't really take perspective on it, right? So if this is where I operate, then I'm going to be having a pretty egocentric world of the, you know, view of the world. If, if you talk about my, my capacity to take perspective, I, I can kind of sense that you have a different perspective than I do. Like I can take multiple perspectives, but only one at a time, right? So, so someone who lives here lives in a, the irony is that they're, they're, they're psychologically not really adults yet. They, they don't really have a psychological sense of self over time. So they, they tend to be often quite hedonistic quite in the moment and impulsive and to be acting out without really thinking things through. Their, their relationship to responsibility is usually one of it's not my fault or I got in with the wrong crowd. Now the reason for this is because the, the, the future is kind of the past which hasn't happened yet. They're, they're not really moved by future consequences. Because to, to be able to take personal responsibility in the way we kind of expect an adult to do, to be moved by future consequences, you have to be able to coordinate two perspectives simultaneously. You have to be able to kind of have an idea of what you want right now, that's one perspective, and what you want in the future. And you have to be able to experience them at the same time. That's the way you can get a, a, a sense of a psychological sense over time, which is exactly what someone who operates from this self-sovereign mind doesn't quite have. So, so there's often a kind of disregard for thinking things through or, or future consequences. It, it's a kind of short-term uh, time period. You know, in terms, of, uh, in terms of relationships then, you know, someone who operates here tends to have relationships that are quite transactional. You know, because other people are kind of suppliers to the self. So what's in it for me? You know, you're, you're, if we have a relationship, you know, if, if, if I feel good around you or you can provide me with certain things or, or, or you get in the way of me achieving my, 
my, my needs and, and, and interests, that's how I will fundamentally see you. And as a result of that, you know, relationships tend to be quite transactional. There, there's a lack of, of intimacy and shared mutuality. Uh, relationships can be quite exploitative and, and quite manipulative. There, there's a tendency to, to objectify um, other beings or, or, or other humans. Uh, dichotomies, you know, at, at this stage of development, there's, there, there's usually a, a, an emphasis on the physical world um, and a pretty black and white thinking style. You know, people who operate here haven't really developed that much nuance yet in their thinking, subtlety in their thinking, the, the, the ability to to contextualize. So there's pretty there's often pretty very straightforward ideas of right and wrong, and they often get kind of angry or confused by by the subtleties and nuance and complexity and even worse shades of gray that some other people claim to see because their world is often quite black and white in terms of right or wrong. You know, their relationship to authority is often one of power, you know. Uh, might is right, whatever you can get away with. Uh, that's the sort of opportunistic types of ethics that people who operate here uh, tend to use. You know, get, get what you can while you can. In terms of the work environment, you know, people who, who operate here, you know, they, they can be... Um, Susan Cook Reuter, the ego development researcher, you know, talks about this stage of, of development as the opportunist and, and by that, she means that they, they can often have a, a, a hunch or, or, or a, a street, smart, street smart sense of opportunity um, in you know, entrepreneurship or, 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 or getting ideas. You know, they're, they're, they're unconstrained by the kind of ethical concerns and long-term thinking that other people often go through. And, and that can be a strength. And if they're well-placed, you know, for example, in a, co in, in a company, or if, if you have a, a job that's very straightforward, where, where the job description is very clear, and there's, there's clear kind of external rewards and, and incentives, um, often good in, in situation where, where there's risk so these sorts of environments is very often where the opportunist uh, tends to shine. Now, again, depending upon the person's personality tendencies, if you look at this from a five-factor analysis, you know, where you have uh, openness to experience as one variable, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, um, you, you can have a person who's kind of immature and psychologically not really an adult who's still a decent human being, who, who's still quite a, a kind and um, generous human being a, a, as long as you don't challenge them or, 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 or disrespect them, right? So that person might have a perceived need or interest to be kind, or to be decent, or to be honest, or to be heroic. What they can't do well, though, is to really contextualize it, or to see a larger picture, or, or, or to really create a shared understanding with other people. So one of my favorite examples of this sort of limitation is in the book The Discerning Heart by Philip Lewis, he talks about this young man who walks up to an older woman who, who has some bags, you know, groceries, and she's standing by a street corner. He grabs up her bags, grabs her by the arm, and very elegantly escorts her to the other side of the street. And, and the woman says, you know, thank you, young man, but, but 
I was actually waiting for someone to pick me up over there, right? So, so, so he obviously was nice and, 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 and had a need to, you know, be kind, but, but what, what he wasn't able to really do was to take her perspective into account when doing so, right? Um, one thing that's really interesting too is if, if you look at the so-called cluster B personality disorders, you know, people who get diagnosed with, whether it's psychopathy or, which isn't really a diagnosis, but, but, but psychopathy or the social personality disorder or antisocial personality, personality disorder, it's not quite the same as psychopathy. So psychopathy is more a constellation of personality tendencies and antisocial personality disorder is more the kind of behavioral manifestations of this, right? But, or, or if you look at borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder, what you'll see as a common denominator is that people have not really developed a stable psychological sense of self enduring over time. And, and I would argue that many of these people operate from Keegan's stage two or the, the, the self-sovereign mind. Could, could, could someone have these personality tendencies, especially of, for example, narcissism or psychopathy and perhaps have evolved beyond that? Sure. I, I, I'm just saying that this is very typical. So, so for example, if, if you take someone uh, who, who would score high on psychopathy or, or a person with highly psychopathic traits, you would likely find Keegan stage two, this self-sovereign mind, and personality-wise, you would find someone who scored quite high on extroversion, especially the, the kind of bold, you know, assertiveness, uh, assertiveness, activity dimensions, and who scored very low on agreeableness, obviously, and low on uh, conscientiousness and neuroticism. Th there you kind of have the profile for... For, for, for someone who, who would score high in, in, in psychopathic traits. So on a, on a group level, where do you find, what, where do you find uh, strong concentrations of these folks? Or what would a community look like of adults where this form of mind were dominant? Well, think about the prison population. You know, if, if you look at the regular population in the Western world, a society like Norway where I live or, or, pl or places in the United States, for example, most adults probably are somewhere on the journey between that kind of socialized mind, which is the next stage after the self-sovereign mind, and the self-authoring mind. Th this is the typical journey too for people who enter psychotherapy. I would argue that, because I've spent quite a bit of time talking to prisoners, people in the prison population, that people in the prison population who are adults, here you see a strong dominance of that, um, of that self-sovereign mind. You, you, you see a mindset that's quite self-centered, manipulative, cunning, uh, that's quite hedonistic in the moment, a disregard for future consequences, a, a lack of much guilt or, or, or empathy, an emphasis on the physical world and, and people who don't really self-reflect or seem to have that much access to their own inner subjective world or, or who really care that much about other people's inner subjective world either. You, you, you would see more of that. And of course, if, if you live in, in a rough part of town or in poverty or, you know, where life is kind of like a jungle out there, you probably want access to this form of mind. Whether you live there or whether you can access this form of thinking as a choice. Someone who has evolved beyond this mind might still be able to access these capacities as a choice in a particular context. 
but for the person where this is the leading edge, this is where they live. This is this is where they actually operate. You know, if 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 you go to a rough bar, you know, you'll you, you'll see this sort of mind. You know, if if you look at um, reality shows on TV, you, you you see this particular form of mind. Um, if if you if you see it to it to excess somewhere, you know the the kind of dark side of it. You get the warlords, you get gangsterism, you get hit squads, uh, you, you get an exploitation of the weak, you know, a rough world where you have the haves and the have nots. And, you know, living from this form of mind as an adult is kind of tough because you, you're not really equipped for the modern world, so to speak, or regular adult life. So, so there's this perception that other people are, you know, objects that can either be useful or who stand in the way and there, other people are competitors or threats. So th th there, there's kind of two versions of it, right? There, there, there's the person who kind of goes out there and wants to dominate and to, and, and, and to conquer. That would be the kind of like strong version. Or you could have the more weak person, which would be the person who lives more as a parasite. So I remember I worked as a year as a consultant for the long-term unemployed, and I saw a lot of people. I'm not claiming that everyone who is long-term unemployed operates from this form of mind, but there are quite a few people who do. And they live as parasites. They, they, they live as victims. They, they exploit. They can be quite cunning. They, they don't really take responsibility. You know, that, that sort of, of, of mindsets. What you also have with people who operate here is, is, is a lack of guilt, a lack of any real like internal principle standards for, for anything. And they're, they're not motivated by psychological abstractions or loyalty or a cause or of being part of something bigger. It, it's a quite simple, straightforward. It, it does not mean stupid. Someone who operates here and is kind of immature could still be a genius. The, the, the person could still have a, a, a high IQ in the conventional sense. The person might be extremely skilled at a particular craft or, 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 or have certain you know, abilities or talents that, that, that they can use. Um, if, if you want to look at too where you could find examples of this in the world I, I would say look at look at Andrew Tate the, uh, the the YouTube influencer former kickboxer um, specifically look at his teachings look at his message his message is very much one uh, that resonates with this self sovereign mind it's all about power getting strong, dominating, conquering. It's, it's a world of haves versus have not, nots. Uh, th th there's really no emphasis on, uh, let's say, empathy or compassion or kindness or, or, or subjective experience. It, it, it's all about building your biceps, you know, driving fancy cars, status symbols, treating relationships as completely transactional, objectifying and dominating other people. Now, I, I don't know Andrew Tate a, a, as a person. Um, I've obviously never met him. I, I don't know to what extent he is guilty or not guilty of the, the, the charges which have been leveled you know, towards him. I think everyone should be given that presumption of, of innocence. But when I look at, you know, comments that he has given in interviews where he brags about, you know, exploiting desperate men 
and and seducing women and then using them as tools to exploit uh, desperate men. There, there's a kind of cunningness and a callousness, you know, in that. And uh, again, I, I don't really know whether that socialized mind is Andrew's limit or whether he's marketing that as a choice. But, but, but I know that his message is very likely to resonate with people who operate from that self-sovereign mind and perhaps who have certain kind of dark tribe personality traits in addition to that. Now, Andrew Tate has embraced Islam and is, is looking for meaning, right? So that, that might be more of that socialized mind, you know, um, coming, coming into play. If, if we look at psychotherapy or coaching or, or change work, you know, my experience is that these folks don't really self-reflect that much. So the, the, the topics they have a tendency to come in for are pretty, you know, concrete topics often like stopping smoking or, or they may have been, they may have a partner who's kind of, on their case to, 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 to change some sort of topic so they come in or, or, or they want to improve something. Um, when, when, when these people depress or anxietize, and notice how I'm using terms like anxietize and depress because these are processes, these are activities that people go into. It's not really so much a, a psychological form of depressing or anxietizing. It's more concrete. Remember, this person is fused with, subject to their own enduring needs, interests, and agendas. That's who they are. That's what they view life through. So when these people depress and anxietize, it's usually about their inability to get what they want, you know? So, so they, they, they might not be able to achieve what they want to achieve, or maybe they're being disrespected or, or rejected. They're, they're not getting the respect they want. They, they may be very concerned with how other people view them, not because how other people view them become a part of how they view themselves, which would be the typical more socialized mind. They don't do that, but it's more like if that person doesn't think I'm cool or attractive or, or, or smart or whatever, they may not want to do cool things with me. It, it, it's, it's more that sort of sort of thing. So doing change work or coaching or psychotherapy with people at this stage of, of development it is often about helping them to develop new ways of getting more of what they want. You know, other ways, be, being more flexible with their behaviors. Um, you know, it, it, it might be a, a teenager or young adult who's being bullied, you know, and, and one solution might be to join a boxing gym or to, to, to join a mixed martial arts gym and, and, and to actually learn how to fight. You know, or, or, or learning how to do sales better or learning how to seduce better or it's, it's more these sorts of things. It's less around self-reflection. Uh, I, I, I used to teach reality-based self-defense for 16 years. I, I think I've done way more use with teenagers and young adults at this stage of development by helping them develop the capacities to defend themselves effectively and and helping them kind of internalize the philosophy that I've ever done as a quote unquote psychotherapist or 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 coach. Um, so so again helping them achieve their goals in in in, in new ways. Uh, becoming more flexible, developing particular skills, but also 
gradually helping them to open up more of their subjective world, to develop thoughts about thoughts and feelings about feelings and, and, and the ability to, to self-reflect, right? In terms, of, um, in terms of spiritual awakening, you know, quite a few young people have had these sorts of non-dual unity experiences where th that sense of, you know, being in here is separate from a world out there temporarily dissolves and it feels like there's just life emerging. There, there's, just, there's, there's just oneness, for example. Uh, experiences like this can 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 happen spontaneously, um, but then they're also likely to be interpreted through a very narrow, egocentric form of mind, and this is what I think sometimes happen when you have some gurus or people who may have had meditative realizations you know and genuine insights in one sense but psychologically they're immature you know so so suddenly they start uh you know behaving sexually inappropriately with their female students and they start ripping off their male students and and, and stuff like that and you, you you may make the point that you know the the these folks have not had realizations, which may also be true, but, but you, you can also get this, well, why it's just the universe fucking itself. There's no separation. There's no, why shouldn't I have sex with your wife? You know, it's all made up. It's all, it's all one thing. You know, you, 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 you get these sorts of, <laughs> there's, there's of course a, a, and an insight behind seeing how everything is made up and ultimately just life expressing itself, but it, but it's being interpreted through a very egocentric form of mind, which which then can lead to quite uh, exploitative types of behaviors. So in terms of helping people who operate from this stage of, of consciousness, I can highly recommend the work, the, the work of William Glasser, for example. The, he authored a book called Reality Therapy, where, where he talks about how he helped juvenile delinquents uh, live better lives and stop doing symptoms. And, and, and he, he did it through teaching them a philosophy of personal responsibility and mental illness being a myth and helping them to develop better choices to get more of what they want in the moment. Choices that also kind of take other people's needs into account because it benefits you. You know, so, so, so choice theory has, ha, has been um, great. You know, anything that, that helps people to, to develop more choice I think Jordan Peterson, you know, when, when people begin to, when, when people begin to make a transition towards that socialized mind, which I will cover in, in, in the next video, where, where people gradually start to internalize the society that they're part of, so that society becomes part of them and they become part of society. You know, what often happens is that, you know, the, the, the world becomes too complex to deal with using that very egocentric form of meaning making and, and this very black and white, right and wrong way of thinking. So they start to look for, they start to look for meaning and, and, and for structure, for example. So I think one reason why Jordan Peterson has had such an enormous appeal. Now, Jordan Peterson is a quite complex, astute thinker. He, he does not operate at the self-sovereign mind. And I'm not saying that everyone who's affected or influenced or inspired by Peterson's teachings are operating there either, not by a long shot. But, but what I think he often does is I think he often reaches, especially young men, who are somewhat in that transition between that very egocentric self-sovereign mind 
who are beginning to become socialized. And what they're looking for is meaning. They're looking for order. They're looking for structure. They're, they're, they're looking for some sort of way to create a meaningful, orderly life for themselves. And here comes Jordan Peterson, and he offers exactly that. You know, you, you have the book, 12 Rules for Life. You, you have, what he offers is a, a kind of psychological philosophy that people can internalize and use as a roadmap to create order and, 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 and relationships. You know, a philosophy largely based upon personal responsibility and, and, and doing one's best to not use hedonism, but, but to actually create a meaningful life. Uh, of course, he, he also tends to reach well people who move from the socialized mind to the self-authoring mind because he also helps people to develop that more self-authored capacity. You know, uh, so, so that, that's, a, that, that's a useful thing to consider too. You know, people, things like going into the military or becoming part of a sports team or entering into a committed relationship and having a child, you know, th things that kind of not force people, but inspire people to begin to subordinate their own agendas and interests uh, in support of something larger and bigger than themselves, to be part of a group or a family or a sports team or a workplace or a particular philosophical orientation, that's kind of the move towards that more socialized mind. And if someone's, you know, over 30, you know, and they operate from that um, self-sovereign mind, there's likely movement towards the socialized mind. You know, you, you get more people who operate from a kind of transition space between two forms of mind than you do people who operate, you know, from strictly one form of mind. Important to emphasize here too that those of us who have moved beyond that particular form of mind, and if you're listening to this video, you probably have, you know, because it wouldn't appeal to you otherwise. We still have the capacity to act in egocentric exploitative, manipulative, cunning ways, right? We, we can revert to that under stress, but, but we can also do so as a choice. So for example, if, if you're dealing with, if you're dealing with a person in your life who's an opportunist and an adult who, who operates that way, you know, in the workplace or some other context, you may have to have firm boundaries and, and be willing to, to take a harder line sometimes with people like that to, to not be exploited, but to do so through choice. There's a difference between using tough love or having firm boundaries or, 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 or uh, standing up and being willing to fight or take a stance through principle choice than it is for someone who just operates that way kind of unconsciously you know if you talk about you know tv shows if you ask people who are in prison for example what are what are the typical things that people will often watch and again i i'm not claiming that everyone in prison operates from this form of mind that's not true what i'm saying is that you, you'll get more people who operate from this form of mind and you may have some sort of movement towards a socialized mind. You know, the, the, the TV shows will be physically oriented, stronger, faster, bigger, immediate reward, you know, whether it's Pawn Shop Las Vegas or Big Brother or, you know, just sporting events. Not that those things are wrong, but, but what the person who operates here probably won't get into is more philosophical, abstract, you know, discussions about meaning or that, that's probably not quite, you know, um, 
not quite on the table. Um, so yeah, I think I think that was pretty much. Oh, there, there's a, a very interesting program, you know, for for uh, juvenile delinquents, something called Mendota Prison in Wisconsin. Now these are psychopaths or people who have been diagnosed to have a highly psychopathic traits and these people in all likelihood operate strongly from that self-sovereign mind this is a prison program that has actually been quite successful and what they're doing there is is that they're not so much trying to reform people through punishment or guilt because people who operate from this form of mind they're not really feeling guilt they might say that they're feeling guilt, but, but if you inquire, you'll notice that the guilt is more a fear of getting caught or a worry about what consequences might uh, come upon them as a result of someone else feeling bad. It's, it's, it's more of that. What they did at Mendota Prison was to create a system of like immediate rewards. So you're, you're rewarding positive behavior you know if you act better you get immediate rewards and that sort of learning you know that, that that sort of learning that that emphasizes immediate external rewards and incentives for good behavior seems to work the best to motivate people who operate from this particular form of mind um, i highly recommend reading robert kagan's books uh, they're all great the discerning heart by philip lewis is great and and my own book you know provocative suggestions that's the second book i wrote has quite a few case stories of how i have worked with people who seem to operate from this particular form of mind you know and, and dealing with people who operate here can be quite challenging you know if you, you if you live somewhere and you see someone driving a beat-up car and they're just you know their, their, their stereo is 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 the music is loud and they're driving way too fast you know in a neighborhood where there's kids that's in all likelihood you know, either a person on drugs or, or, or someone who operates from this more uh, more self-sovereign mind. I'll, I'll end with giving a couple of stories uh, from real life. You know, I, I worked as a bouncer for about six months. And, and one day I saw two guys about to get into it. And one guy looked like he was about to set up the other guy with a sucker punch. And I was like, okay, this is not good. So I jumped in because they both had quite a few people behind them they were all people who liked to drive their cars around the city center and i was like hey 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 what's going on and one guy says he drove past me and i truly didn't get it so i i gave this sincere comment back of like so do a lot of people every time you park your car and i i, I didn't intend this to confuse them but, but i think they sensed that my confusion was genuine so they got kind of confused and what I got was that driving by meant disrespect, right? So, so, so being disrespected, being shamed, losing face, you know, honor culture, that's a big thing, you know, for this form of mind. So, so the, the, the person was looking to, to, to get his respect back, you know, essentially. And, and so, so, to, to solve this, I said, okay, so I, I got a challenge for you. And I got a challenge for you. You man enough to accept the challenge? You man enough to accept the challenge? Okay, here's what you're gonna do. Get in each of your cars, three rounds around the city center. I'll be the judge. The winner wins, the loser buys a beer, everything's fine. You in, you in. They both said yes. They were both drunk. They both got into their cars. They did three rounds around the city center. This was completely irresponsible. You know, they could have killed someone. And, and for me as the bouncer, this was a, a crazy solution, but it worked. They drank, they made up, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, that was that.
All right, I, I hope this was useful. If you have any comments or questions, you know, please post them where you find the video. Um, if you like the way I think and you want to make some changes and you want to explore whether you and I could be a good fit for either mentoring or change work, you can reach me at provocativehypnosis.com. If you're watching this in 2024, I'm doing a full one day uh, online seminar on how I work with clients who struggle with anger. It's based upon 27 years of experience and seeing clients. Uh, if you're curious about that, go to the seminar page at provocativehypnosis.com. I was supposed to do a seminar, seminar tour in Australia this October. I couldn't get a visa. You know, something went wrong there. So that seminar is gonna be going to be online. So if you wanna learn the psychological illusion model, this is happening in October. So go to the seminar page at Provocative Hypnosis, click on that Australia link, and uh, you'll be able to learn the psychological illusion model if you want to. Okay, as always, thanks for listening.